Mystic Path to Cosmic Power by Vernon Howard Chapter 10 The Mystic Path to Lasting Happiness What is the brand of happiness experienced by most men and women? Buddha illustrated the sad state of affairs with a remarkably enlightening story. A traveler was passing through the forest when he was sighted and pursued by a tiger. He fled frantically away until stopped by a cliff. Spying a vine hanging down its side, he lowered himself downward. But the vine was too short for him to reach the ground. Just then, he saw another tiger below, growling viciously. Tiger above and tiger below, what could be worse? Hanging there, the man saw a luscious-looking strawberry growing on the side of the cliff. Reaching out, he took the strawberry between his fingers, bit into its flavor, and happily exclaimed, How delicious! That is how it is with most people. Caught between the tigers of fear and despair, they find a distracting strawberry, a new excitement, more money, social success, and call it happiness. It need not be like that at all. We can get rid of the tigers. Then, we can truly enjoy whatever strawberries life offers. We must see what happiness is not. It is not exterior activity. That is merely a distraction from inner unhappiness. What then is happiness? The answer is not complex. Happiness is simply a state of inner freedom. Freedom from what? With a bit of self-insight, Every individual can answer that question for himself. It is freedom from the secret angers and anxieties we tell no one about. It is freedom from fear of being unappreciated and ignored, from muddled thinking that drives us to compulsive actions, and later, to regrets. It is freedom from painful cravings that deceive us into thinking that our attainment of this person or of that circumstance will make everything right. Happiness is liberty from everything that makes us unhappy. Happiness is formless. It cannot be fitted into the frame of our demands. We insist upon this wife or husband, this career or achievement, this home, this security, excitement or distraction. Even if we get our demands, we are no happier than before. We have merely covered our unhappiness. It is still there and it will inevitably show itself when change occurs. We must break the frame altogether and just let life happen. Then, we enter an amazing new world whose existence we never before suspected. For a happy life is joy in the truth, Augustine. Quietly question every idea you have about yourself. Ask, it is possible that I am an entirely different person than I imagine I am. Suspect that it might be so. By doing this, you set a miracle in motion. It is an extraordinary experience of awakening to newness. You get a different feeling toward yourself. You cannot define it, nor need you try. But how definite is this first faint stirring of something else? If you dip only a single finger into a great river, you feel its powerful flow at once. That is how it comes to us. The truth about enduring happiness. We can correct our understanding by seeing that pleasurable feelings are not at all the same thing as happiness. Notice how feelings of pleasure alternate with pangs of displeasure, much like walking alternately between cool shade and boiling heat. Also notice the vague heaviness and anxiety that lies behind emotional excitement. Sensing its impermanency, we painfully know we must soon search around for another source of artificial stimulation. Pleasurable sensations are like greedy dragons, requiring constant feeding. But enduring happiness and bliss are entirely different from fleeting pleasures. Thus, we see that though the true aim of mankind is the avoidance of pain and the attainment of bliss, yet owing to a fatal error man, though trying to avoid pain, pursues a deluding something named pleasure, mistaking it for bliss that the attainment of bliss and not pleasure is the universal and highest necessity is indirectly proved by the fact that man is never satisfied with one object of pleasure. He always flies from one to another, from money to dress, from dress to property, thence to conjugal pleasure. There is a restless continuity. 
and so he is constantly falling into pain, even though he wishes to avoid it by the adoption of what he deems proper means. Yet an unknown and unsatisfied craving seems ever to remain in his heart. All this does not deny us the right to enjoy life. It does not take away authentic feelings of delight. It does just the opposite. By not depending upon fleeting pleasures, we find lasting ones. No one and no circumstance can ever take away this inner gladness. As a matter of fact, people are much too serious. They mistakenly think that seriousness somehow indicates earnestness. Even their playtime is grim, just as if it is something they must do. Have you noticed the strange compulsion lurking beneath many so-called recreations? This playtime is heavy, not springing spontaneously from a free spirit, but from a burdensome sense of duty. We think we are somebodies who have a duty to keep our lives on the go. What a dreadful idea. In reality, we are blithe spirits who must learn to play as such. With this special kind of purposelessness, we find real delight and lasting meaning in life. Genuine mystics are not afraid to be playful and twinkle-eyed men. Happiness is one of the marks of the cosmic sense. Richard Morris Buck, Cosmic Consciousness. How to enjoy yourself. I would like to relax and enjoy myself, as you suggest, but I don't know how. There is no how in enjoying yourself. You just go ahead and do it without plan and without thought. Children have this spontaneity. They have not as yet been ruined by society. Why don't you just go ahead and have a good time? Why explain? Why try to justify it? Why not just run out and play? I don't know. Would you really like to know why you don't? Yes, I can take it. You are afraid of enjoying yourself. You have a false sense of guilt, which prevents you from letting go. You feel disloyal to your pretenses, that of being a very earnest and sincere sort of person who has no time for such triviality. Also, I must tell you this, you are not earnest toward life anyway. You are grim and gloomy, but you prefer to call this earnestness. You can be properly earnest only when you have found yourself. Only a self-unified and balanced man can have a good time. I'm afraid you're right. I never saw this before. The above ideas emphasize a major point of mysticism. Self-awakening must be the first and foremost business in anyone's life. Otherwise, he falls into one pit after another without knowing why. To awaken, we must first suspect that we are asleep and that there is another form of consciousness. Here is where shock and suffering aid us. They force us to realize that nothing is really right, in spite of all our claims and pretenses. That nudges us out of our psychic slumber. Let's see why awareness of an unhappy state must precede deliverance from it. Suppose we hear the advice, stop believing only what you want to believe. Accurate advice. But it means absolutely nothing, unless a man first suspects that he is believing only what he wishes. Otherwise, he will assume that he is not harming his happiness by doing this. He will falsely credit himself with clear thinking. No, we cannot do anything for ourselves until we are awake to what we do against ourselves. Those who do not observe the movements of their own minds must of necessity be unhappy. Marcus Aurelius Now that I've started to awaken a bit, I seem to run into new difficulties I never had before. Why this extra conflict? A man asleep in a canoe drifting downstream toward a dangerous waterfall feels no difficulties. But when he wakes up and sees his danger, he starts paddling against the current. All the false ideas of life resist the man who begins to awaken. This is a good sign, not one to fear. A single mystical truth like this, clearly understood, is a thousand times more valuable than a head stuffed with vague ideas. If we seek quality first, quantity follows. It is like entering a strange mansion at midnight. We may fumble a bit in finding the light switch to the first room, but once found, we locate the next switch much easier. Each room becomes progressively easier until finally the whole mansion is illuminated. 
You are a receiving set. We cannot increase our basic happiness by altering exterior conditions like marriage, residence, career. Every attempt to do so only increases the sense of despair. It is the essential self that must be changed. Our level of consciousness must be raised. Since this is true, why does almost everyone still try to find happiness in exterior things? Because the truth is not deeply seen and understood. Also, exterior changes give an illusion of newness. But it always wears off. You can easily observe this for yourself. The alternative, then, is interior transformation. And this comes through receptivity to mystical principles. As your consciousness grows, you will see that you are not a sending set, as previously assumed, but a receiver. You have nothing to do but welcome the healthy impressions that seek entrance all day long. This brings relief from useless struggle and from false responsibility. Suppose a television set thought it was the sending station. It would be useless. When it plays its correct role of receiver, it functions normally. How can we be more receptive? A superb start is to become aware of our own resistance to life invigorating truths. We always have contradictory reactions towards spiritual facts. Part of us is thrilled, but another part is annoyed, even hostile. You see, the truth disturbs us. It creates conflict between the false self, which doesn't want the truth at all, and the true self, which yearns for it at any price. Observe your own resistance. That in itself weakens it, makes you alertly receptive. Here again we see the need for being aware of ourselves, for observing what goes on beneath our surface activities. A person might think, for example, that he is very happy while at a picnic. But beneath his outer gaiety, he might have dozens of subconscious worries over his finances or worries about whether others like him or not. A clear awareness of such negativities would destroy them, for the sadness is in the thoughts themselves, not in the finances or in acceptance by others. We are enslaved by anything we do not consciously see. We are freed by conscious perception. People mistakenly assume that they could be happy if only this or that exterior condition would change. No, no man or woman is happy, regardless of his exterior prosperities, if he lives from his false self. The invented self is unhappiness itself. This is a fact which can never be successfully contradicted. Our daily griefs prove it conclusively. It goes like this. The problem, man is unhappy because he lives from his false self. The technique, he honestly observes himself. The result, he finds freedom with his true self. The new state, man is happy. Happiness along the mystic path. See the difference between thinking of the following ideas and thinking from them. It is thinking from that attracts your good. You are making sure progress toward authentic happiness when you 1. Sense that there is something far beyond your present experience. 2. Do not cling to the memory of yesterday. 3. Proceed upon the fact that nothing is too difficult for you to accomplish. 4. Get tired of being unhappy. 5. Determine to live your own life, not the one dictated by a hypnotized society. 6. Don 7. Run so much and so hard. 7. Make small but definite explorations towards self-awakening. 8. Become more and more willing to set aside long-cherished personal opinions. 9. Don't let your intellect stand in the way of your intuition. 10. Cease to blame others for your difficulties and see their source in personal psychic sleep. 11. Realize that mere physical motion does nothing to construct inner castles. 12. Become a more self-aware and self-directed individual. 13. Refuse to compromise with the truth. 14. Understand that all you really need is more inner illumination. 15. See that no one on earth can harm the essential you. 16. Honestly face your inner poverty as a means of discovering your inner wealth. 17. Realize that happiness can never be found in the mere rearrangement of exterior conditions. 18. 
find yourself reflecting more and more about the inner life. 19. Prefer quietness to noise. 20. Glimpse that you cannot be without anything that you really need. 21. Take no thought for tomorrow because you finally see that you don't need to. 22. Do not mechanically go along with negative feelings that arise. 23. See that you get highly paid for working on yourself. 24. Take as a truth, you have tremendous capacities for happiness which need only day-by-day -day development. The opposite sex and happiness. I fall in love with every attractive woman I meet. It's miserable. I meet her and bang, I'm in love. Then the pain begins. I worry that she won't like me, or that I'll lose her. Why does it have to be like this? Why can't love be as nice and romantic as it's supposed to be? This is my secret unhappiness. What can I do? Would you like a frank discussion on this? I may have to tell you things you don't want to hear. Please go ahead. You have never loved any of these women. You are excited over the pleasure they give you. You feel proud to have an attractive woman at your side. You like the physical affection. Or maybe you want sexual relations. You mistake these emotional pleasures for love. Maybe you are right. I don't know. Notice this. Whenever either of you gets tired of the other, the so-called love flies out the window. Indifference or resentment takes its place. Then it wasn't love in the first place. Well, that clarifies at least one thing. When you really love another, there is no disturbance whatsoever. The other person can be nice or unnice, take you or leave you. Your love does not depend upon them behaving the way you want. There are no conditions attached. Whatever happens, you are unaffected and unafraid. Love is a total understanding of yourself in relation to her. Real love has no selfish desire. You love another not because you want something from her, but because it is the very nature of the true self to love. Don't think all this is sentimentality. This is the answer. It is all so original to me. Could you suggest a simple starting point for grasping it? Try to see that love of pleasure from the opposite sex and actually loving her are two entirely different things. Seeing that much, you can now work to understand your own needs for distracting pleasure. Finally, you will never again suffer from this kind of pain. You will be happy with every woman, and every woman, on your own level of psychic success, will be happy with you. Why people run so hard? People fail to transform their lives because they don't stick to one rich stream until they catch a glint of gold. They dig here for a minute, then over there, then dash off to the surface glitter of another stream. How often this happens when a person tries to understand himself. He sees all his contradictions and frustrations, yet fails to work at understanding them. Take the man who drives himself day and night to achieve fame and fortune. He ruins his health, keeps his family in an uproar, makes himself generally miserable. Obviously, he drives himself because he thinks it gives him something, yet every day ends with the same sense of despair. Why? It has to do with the imaginary pictures he holds of himself. He identifies himself as a go-getter, a man of achievement, a financial genius, or something similar. Having set himself up as being this kind of person, he frantically seeks to bring about exterior results to prove it. But it can never be proven, results or not, because this is not his real self at all. It's only an artificial, imaginary, useless mental picture. He can instantly break the mad pattern by dropping all imaginations about himself. You don't mean that we should be lazy toward our everyday tasks in business and society. Not at all. I will tell you a secret worth billions of dollars to industry. I am not exaggerating in the slightest when I say billions of dollars. If employers and employees would shed their imaginary pictures of themselves, they would be 100% more efficient at their work. How come? Listen very carefully. Because imaginary self-pictures always induce reactions of despair, depression, 
carelessness, inefficiency. You see, a free man is not emotionally entangled with his exterior tasks. He handles his business life with perfect ease and efficiency. Nothing bothers him. His spiritual success makes everything just fine. You should tell corporation executives about this. First, their motive must be right. They must want to be free, not to save billions. Remember what we learned about the right order of things? But all this is a deep mystical mystery for you to solve. Spend extra time reflecting on it. The time of your life. Discovering the facts about time is like locating a fabulously rich treasure chest. The first fact is that there are two kinds of time. We have man-made time as measured by clock and calendar. It is useful for handling affairs on the human level, for we need to catch the train on time and we must bake the pie exactly 40 minutes. On the mystical and psychological level, the only time is now. There are no minutes, days, years, past or future, only the eternal now. This is a vast subject, so we must concentrate our study on seeing how time connects with human happiness. Make this revealing experiment. The next time you feel unhappy, take a close look. You will detect its link with something that has already happened or that you think will happen. With most people, the two terrible thieves of happiness are regret of the past and fear of the future. These thieves operate in the dark, that is, unconsciously. Your self-observation exposes them to the light of awareness. A child on a swing gets scared whenever he swings too far forward or backward. So does torment attack the mind when it needlessly swings into the past or future. When the swing halts at its natural position, we rest quietly. It is absolutely impossible to be unhappy now. The present moment is perfect freedom, as Alan W. Watts explains. The letting go or acceptance of your experience and state of mind as it is, is always the act of living completely and perfectly in this moment. For we have noted that ego consciousness is a bondage to time, being essentially a complex of memories and anticipations. All egocentric action has an eye to the past or the future. In the strict present, the ego does not exist. That is easier to prove by experiment rather than by theory. For in concentrating simply and solely upon what is happening at this moment, anticipation and anxiety vanish. Many masters of the spiritual life have therefore laid a special value upon the exercise of living and thinking simply in this moment, letting the past and future drop out of mind. For the ego drops away with them, together with its pride in the past and its fear and greed for the future. Spiritual time, or rather timelessness, connects with every area of life, for example, health. Thousands of patients on sick beds could get up and walk away by penetrating this secret. Psychosomatic illness of every variety spring from the pressure of living in the wrong time. Don't wander from the safety zone of now. During your day, observe how your mind slips backward to yesterday and forward to tomorrow. Catch it. Pull it back. Pull it back to where it belongs, in the here and now. How to change everything. I will put the question as simply as I can and would appreciate just as clear and concise an answer as possible. Why don't we see the reality that could deliver us? Why do we resist our own rescue? A man cannot see anything he is unwilling to see. He is unwilling because he fears that the loss of his false and fixed viewpoints means the loss of himself. He identifies with these viewpoints. He thinks they are him, which they are not. Now, the loss of his old nature is his very rescue, for it leads to reality, to his true self. But he will not plunge into the darkness, fearing that there is nothing beyond. There is, but every man must take the plunge for himself. Then, everything is different. Everything is different once we glimpse at what our great capacities for happiness are. Ignorance of our true center limits our possibilities, much like a millionaire who cramps himself into one small closet of his 50-room mansion. We must follow the lead of Heraclitus, 
the ancient Creek thinker who declared, I sought for myself. Everything is different when we are different. Having seen that our conditioned thinking cannot penetrate spiritual heights, we cease trying. Though it is frightening and shattering to the ego self, we give up, not knowing what will become of us. That does it. The bubble we thought was so beautiful bursts before our eyes, and amazingly, we see beyond it to that which is permanently beautiful. Our inner transformation now extends itself to everyday affairs, transforming them completely. For example, we now understand that there are two ways of seeing other people, one of them harmful, the other one healthy. One way we see people, living in a hypnotized state of cruelty, hypocrisy, arrogance, and other negativities. If this viewpoint is an unconscious projection of similar states that exist in us, it is obviously harmful. This means that we unknowingly see others as we are. There is another way of seeing people in these negative states. We see them as cruel and arrogant, not as an emotionalized projection of our own unseen states, but simply as a fact. It is like seeing a tiger in a zoo. While knowing the tiger is vicious, this knowing is not a projection of our own unconscious cruelty. It is a fact outside ourselves. Only the man who has freed himself from the tiger within his own system can see the tiger in other people and not be bothered by it. Whenever we have an unhappy experience with another person, we must not complain, why did he do this to me? That is the first reaction almost everyone makes. However, it misses the mark entirely. Instead, you must ask, why did I react painfully to what he did? This reaction brings us back to our responsibility for abandoning ego-centered sensitivities. Then, anyone can do anything to you, and there is no pain, only a peaceful understanding. The Pleasures of Self-Forgetting Man's meaningless motions and agonizing appetites are nothing more than attempts to forget himself. Alcohol, social climbing, material acquisition, sexual excess, all are attempts to escape an unwanted self. What is this unwanted self? We come back, as always, to man's false sense of identity. Man yearns to escape from his own pretensions of who he is. Inwardly, he knows that he is not the pseudo-self going around with surface smiles, drawing excitement from applause, swelling with pride over some achievement. His intuitive mind tells him that is all an act, and how weary he is of the routine role. So he tries to forget, but he never succeeds. He always does the wrong thing. His churning and chasing merely cover up the anxiety, leaving it to do its dark destruction. But there is a genuine way of self-forgetting. The false self and its built-in pains can be demolished. Like a ball of string held at one end and rolled along the floor, the false self can become smaller and smaller and finally disappear altogether. Then you forget it. Who thinks about something that doesn't exist? All this, of course, is what the mystic path is all about. Our goal is to exchange the old life for the new. How strange. A man is aware that he lives with family and friends, but rarely considers how he lives with himself. The very center is neglected, like keeping the orange peel and tossing away the fruit. Living with ourselves can be either a very enjoyable experience or a terror, depending upon which self we live with. The higher we go, the less we need to think about the personal self. We attain spiritual self-forgetfulness in which we know peace. Our lives are lived for us. We have no worries about what to do or whether we should do anything or not. Our day rolls forward with a new and mysterious form of indifference, not of the apathetic kind. This inspiring indifference sees through our pretentious ambitions and frantic strivings. It is passive and yet dynamic, alert, wise. We see more, feel more, live more and we don't have to think at all. We are beyond the frustrations of human thought. Rather, we are quietly aware of everything while being emotionally involved in nothing. We just flow along with a gentle carelessness. What is there to worry about? 
the worrying self no longer exists. There is but one virtue, and that is to forget yourself as a person. There is but one vice, and that is to think of yourself. Johann Fichte Does this seem strange and remote to you? Listen, somewhere, deep down, you sense a response. Far below your surface thoughts and feelings, you feel something else quite different, quite thrilling. Do you see it? You will. Do not try to see. Do not think about it. Do nothing. There is nothing you need to do. That is how it goes. It goes all by itself. Lasting happiness in review of this chapter. 1. Try to see what happiness is not. This clears your understanding of what it is. 2. We can be earnest toward life without being grimly serious. 3. A great prize given to the self-liberated man is a new ability for a good time. 4. Self-awakening leads to lasting happiness. 5. Be receptive to inspiring impressions. Let them transform you, quietly and effortlessly. 6. Don't let negative feelings dictate the way you feel. 7. Remember that you now possess all the needed potentialities for happiness in the here and now. Develop them. 8. By understanding the secrets of mystical time, you brighten every hour of your day. 9. The higher you climb in mystical truth, the less you need to bother with yourself. 10. Happiness is a certainty to the man or woman who truly understands it.